Today's episode is sponsored by War Thunder. With tensions rising between Wallachian Voivode, Vladislav II, and Transylvanian Voivode, John Hunyadi, you could bet your life that there was bound to be an explosive fallout. You might remember that these two were once pretty close. Hunyadi had placed Vladislav on the Vlachian throne in the first place, and the two had marched, almost hand in hand, into the Battle of Kosovo, in a united front against the Ottomans. Indeed, both men got a pretty good hiding for their efforts, but only Hunyadi was captured, and embarrassingly, forked out of his own pockets, as well as giving up his own son, in exchange for his freedom. During this time, Vladislav II did not appear to make any effort to come and rescue John Hunyadi, and Hunyadi had not forgotten it. So Hunyadi couldn't trust what would appear to have been one of his closest allies. So maybe he'd have better luck trusting an enemy, one he tried his best to ban from Wallachia and even kill for some time. Before we get into this deadly alliance, a brief message from the sponsor of today's video, War Thunder. War Thunder is an incredibly detailed PvP game that really focuses on its vehicular gameplay. From planes, tanks, helicopters and ships, you can find a wide variety of motorized weaponry spanning back all the way to the 1920s, including historically accurate weaponry. You can even customize your own vehicle to your liking with hundreds of camouflages, decals and 3D decorations. One of the features I've really enjoyed about War Thunder's gameplay is the damage system, where your artillery can actually disfigure and impair your enemy's vehicle, blasting away its components and affecting the crewmates inside. I've also enjoyed utilizing the damage x-ray system, allowing players to see exactly where they've struck their opponent, as well as where they themselves have been struck too. You can play War Thunder now for free on PC, PlayStation and Xbox. Be sure to use my exclusive link in the comments below where new players and players who haven't logged in in six months can claim a free large bonus pack. The pack includes multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, an exclusive 3D decorator for your vehicle, and much, much more. This bonus is also available on all platforms. Be quick though, as this offer is only available for a limited time. And now back to you, Vlad. It is understood that Vlad and John Hunyadi actually did meet in Hungarian territory, and it was here that they apparently put aside any differences, both politically and personally, in an effort to achieve mutual desires. Despite the murder of his father and brother, Vlad had accepted the alliance with Hunyadi, likely on the account that he had nowhere left to turn at this point. Remember, he was creeping around Wallachia trying to avoid Hunyadi's assassins. On the other hand, Hunyadi likely accepted the alliance with Vlad on the account that Vlad knew the Turks, having grown up with them, and more importantly, knew the Sultan Mehmed II, and therefore, perhaps, how best to defeat them. It should also be noted that after having to pay his way out of Barossian imprisonment, Hunyadi had lost a lot of respect from his peers, and so may have been even more down on his luck than Vlad was. So in a strange twist of fate, two bitter enemies had become each other's most powerful assets. After receiving recommendations from Hunyadi, the new Hungarian king Ladislaus Posthumus gave Vlad the authority and the responsibility of defending Transylvania from the Turks. In 1456, the Turks made a move on Hungary, and whilst Hunyadi responded, he ordered Vlad to stay in Transylvania and act as a last line of defense against the Turks if anything went wrong. But just like last time, Vlad's opportunistic side got the better of him, and he disobeyed Hunyadi's orders and made a surprise attack against the Wallachian voivode Vladislav II. Here in the summer of 1456, Vlad, with a small army of mercenaries, broke into Wallachia and intercepted an unsuspecting Vladislav. Legend has it that instead of slaughtering each other's men, Vlad and Vladislav agreed to settle their dispute in single combat, and it was here in front of each other's hosts, that Vlad fulfilled his promise to avenge his murdered brother and father, and ended his cousin's life by his own hand. Here, Vlad reclaimed the title of Voivode of Wallachia, and so began his second reign over the much sought-after territory. 
It was this rain that Vlad would begin to sow the seeds of his terrifying, yet undeniably effective, reputation. He rebranded himself not just as Voivode of Wallachia, but sovereign ruler of Wallachia, Prince Vlad. He saw to the execution of the boyars who participated in the murdering of his older brother and father. He wasted no time in revolutionizing the affairs of Wallachia, assuming control of distribution of money, property and goods, as well as being heavily involved in the region's foreign affairs. For one, he sent his cousin Stefan back to Moldovia, and with his full support, had him usurp his treacherous uncle, Peter Aaron, and also get revenge for his father's murder. With his cousin in power over in Moldovia, Vlad would have, in essence, united the Wallachian and Moldovian regions, with a steadfast alliance not seen before. But Vlad's movements during this time, none the least his declaration of princehood over Wallachia, would come to the concern of Mehmed II. The Ottomans were suspicious of Vlad's movements, and having recognised his newfound power in Wallachia, sent an envoy to receive tribute from him. Whilst Vlad did indeed pay the envoy on this occasion, he refused requests to return with them to face the Sultan in person. You'll remember that the last time Vlad had made this journey as a young boy, his father was imprisoned by the Sultan, and both Vlad and his brother were torn away from him. Naturally, you might say Vlad was suspicious of this himself, and so decided not to travel back with the envoy to meet the Sultan. Here, the tensions between Vlad and the Ottomans was placated by his payment of the tribute, but it would not remain this way for long. In the meantime, Vlad would go about settling matters at home in Wallachia by consolidating his power. The first to be addressed, as aforementioned, were the boyars, the rich nobles who didn't exactly share a reputation of honesty. To many, these were corrupt men, who were prone to scheming and manipulation. None the least were usually at the sake of the voivode. It is no secret that the boyars sought to keep the weakest candidate available in power so that they were able to influence his decisions, or puppeteer him as they saw fit in order to implement their own rule behind the shadows. It was not beyond the boyars to cast out and scheme against voivodes who did not obey them, much as we saw them do against Vlad's older brother, Machia II, when he was left in charge. If you remember, Vlad had sworn vengeance on those responsible for Machia's death, and so, with that in mind, he went to the site of Machia's grave, dug up his body, and found that the terrible torture he'd received was indeed true given the markings on his body. With this grim revelation now clear to Vlad, the boyars who'd allowed this to happen were about to meet with even more gruesome demises. Vlad invited the boyars and their families to the palace of Targoviste for a meal, but once the feast had ended, Vlad seized hold of every boyar and their wives in attendance. The elderly amongst them were taken outside of the city and were impaled. This by comparison was a mercy, the young and able were marched 15 miles in chains up the Argesh River, a trek that would take two whole days to complete, where they were forced to start building Vlad's very own castle, the Poinari Castle. Whilst the castle itself might have been a gruelling revenge for Vlad against the boyars, it was also an exercise of power, a show of strength, that warned both those of Wallachia and the surrounding regions that if they betrayed him, punishment would not be light. Furthermore, the building of the castle was also a message to the Hungarians and the Ottomans, for it was not permitted for a vassal, prince or not, to build such a fortification as the Poinari Castle, a fortress, if you will, that one could defend from should they need to. Supposedly, the construction of such a building was a threatening gesture, one that would keep the Hungarian state and the Ottomans on their toes. Beyond this, Vlad went about replacing the boyars with his own entourage of trusted men, many of whom were peasant folk when compared to the rich nobles who'd occupied the role before them. It would appear that during his rule, and arguably his lifetime, Vlad valued one thing above all else, integrity. Whether or not this was something instilled in him in his later years as ruler of Wallachia, or whether this had come about from his childhood trauma, of seeing his father and brother ruthlessly betrayed, Vlad came to rule with a heightened sense of principles and honour. He did not tolerate the scheming boyars, 
hence why he got rid of them from his court, and chose to confide in the simpler, more honest intentions of people, those who had his and the country's best intentions in mind, and not how to line their own pockets and consolidate their own power. Trust became an important factor to Vlad, something some might say he came to obsess about, though this is not surprising given that he'd seen firsthand how the trust his father had placed in people had essentially gotten him killed. In a way, Vlad was intent on establishing a Valachia that was loyal to him, and sought to stamp out any potential betrayals or schemes before they could even arise, even if this meant frequently and obsessively testing his subjects. There exist stories of Vlad who was on the cusp of paranoia, a man who was so transfixed on maintaining men who were loyal to him and him alone that he would dress up as a peasant and mingle amongst the lower class to ensure that people were abiding by his rule and that no one was planning anything against him. He valued honesty so much so that it was not beneath him to seek out the answers for himself and to make sure that the people were loyal to him. This seeking of honesty would become a reoccurring theme in Vlad's life and he would look for such a trait in people, whereby he would reward them greatly for their integrity or punish them harshly for their deceit. Such a story exists where the merchant from Florence arrived in Targovish Day with a carriage full of money and goods. The merchant, who was worried about being robbed, asked Vlad personally for his protection during his stay, but Vlad assured him that nothing would happen to his wares and that he should leave his belongings in the town square before coming to meet with him. The merchant did as he was told, but when he returned, he found his goods and money had been stolen. Returning to Vlad, the prince was outraged that someone within his own land had acted so dishonestly. He assured the merchant that both his stolen belongings and the thief would be uncovered. It is in moments like these that we then see Vlad's moral compass spin out of control and his pursuit of an honest Valachia reached new extremes. For the sake of the merchant's stolen goods, Vlad ordered the citizens of Targovish Day to search the streets for them and to root out the thief in question and apprehend him. If they failed, Vlad threatened to destroy the city. So as to compensate the merchant, Vlad replaced the stolen money from his own treasury, but secretly added in an extra ducat. The merchant left, but upon counting the money, he learned that Vlad had paid him extra by a mere ducat. At this discovery, the merchant returned to Vlad to explain that he'd been overpaid, if you could call it that, and proceeded to hand Vlad back the extra ducat. With this, Vlad thanked the merchant for his honesty and explained that he'd given him the extra ducat to see if he would return or not. He also revealed that the thief had been apprehended and that had the merchant not come clean about the extra ducat, he'd have been impaled alongside the thief. It would appear that during his second rule, despite his harsh but fair tendencies, Vlad was well liked, particularly by the lower class. This may have come about because of how keen he was to associate himself with men of virtue and candour, many of which were found amongst the peasantry but also because of his disdain for the upper class. Those who were corrupt found that they could not buy nor tempt Vlad with money or resources, nor was he a man they could intimidate. Bribes did not work against him, and he did not turn a blind eye to injustices of any scale, hence why he quickly became a popular ruler amongst his people. It was perhaps one of the first times that Valachia had a prince who was not only a conscientious man, but one with the discipline and authority to actualize his more noble principles. Join us next time for the adventures of Vlad, where we see our dastardly hero get stuck into his second reign and understand how this pivotal period of rule would change not only the political landscape for Valachia, but shape the legend of a man that was either a most righteous ruler of old Romania or a diabolical torturer with a thirst for blood. Don't forget to check out the sponsor of today's video, War Thunder, available on PC, PlayStation and Xbox. By using my link in the comments below, you'll get access to premium vehicles, a premium account and an exclusive 3D decorator for your vehicle, as well as much much more. 
Be quick though, as this offer is only available for a limited time. Oh, and uh, did you hear? We've got new merch. Gilgamesh merch, to be precise. To celebrate the release of the second tablet, which I assure you will be out before the year is over, why not grab yourself a Team Gilgi or a Team Enkidu t-shirt? Can't decide on which team to pick? No worries, buy both. It is the latest fashion in Uruk, after all. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to leave this video a like, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.